Good evening. Thank you so much for joining us and welcome to Politics in the Time of Coronavirus with politics professor Dan Schnur. I'm Jessica Deganzig, Vice President of Events for the Los Angeles World Affairs Council and Town Hall, and we are thrilled to have you joining us tonight. Dan will be focusing on two topics this evening. The first, groceries, gasoline, and the holiday season, Biden's economic challenge. The second, critical race theory, the newest political football. An important part of our events and Dan's favorite part of our programs is hearing from you. So we'll be taking your questions in about 30 minutes. You can submit your questions using the control panel on the right-hand side of your screen and entering your question in the questions section there. I will join back in about 30 minutes and be reading those off. So please be sure to send your questions in as soon as possible. Dan, thank you so much uh, for joining us tonight and for navigating all of this crazy news and, and changes. So I will turn this conversation over to you and join you back in 30, 30 minutes with some questions from our audience. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Jessica. And for those of you who didn't see Jessica's note in the chat box, she tells us that her baby is very wiggly and excited to hear Dan talk about inflation. So who is, aside from me, is not surprised that Jessica Duganzik's child is already being so precocious when it comes to politics and public policy. But anyway, we've got a couple of uh, topics to cover tonight, as Jessica mentioned. And we're gonna start out by talking about the politics of inflation. And before we get into this at all, already I'm gonna ask Claire to put the first question up to ask you just to frame our discussion. So Claire, if we can get started right away with question number one for our group. And our question for you, as you can see, is how much have you personally been impacted by increased inflation? And we ask this question, obviously, not to gauge your opinion, but just to get a sense of the personal experiences of those who gather with us each week. Has inflation, number one, had a major impact on your spending decisions and on your life? Now, number two, has the rising costs been an annoyance but not had a significant impact in the way you live. Third, would you say, well, I've read about it and I'm concerned about it, but it really hasn't impacted my life all that much. Or fourth, you know, this is a transitory problem, it's temporary, and it's not a great concern. So let's start out with that question just as a benchmark and see how we do. And very interesting, more than half of our group, 47%, most notably, almost half, say that, We've read about the issue and are concerned about it, but it hasn't impacted our lives. And another 8% say that it's not an issue of really great concern. So more than half, 55%, have not really felt an impact of inflation. And I think that's a good reminder as we go further into the discussion uh, that our group's experience may not reflect that of the electorate uh, as a whole. 33%, uh, as you may have seen, um, there we go, thank you, Claire. Say it's been an annoyance, but not a major impact on the lives. Only 12% of us uh, say that already inflation is at a major impact on our lives. And nationwide polling shows much different responses on that issue, and we'll talk more about that a little bit later. But let's start with the basics. So just as America is emerging from the coronavirus pandemic, we're facing our country's biggest inflationary spike in decades. And we're seeing around the country immense price hikes threatened to undermine the recovery. And this in turn poses an entirely new type of economic challenge to the Biden presidency. When Biden ran for president in 2020, the nation's chief economic concern was growth, given what the COVID shutdown had done uh, to so many businesses uh, around the country and what it had done to consumer habits, of course, as well. Now the challenge isn't how to engender growth, but in some ways too much growth, leading to the kind of inflation that we have not seen since the 1970s and early 80s. Now the president's dealing with a very unusual economic situation here. And even if you think back to the 70s and 80s, this is a different type of inflation. Because what we're seeing here is a very unusual combination of very rapidly increasing consumer demand, booming consumer demand. But on the other hand, as well, at the same time, very dramatic supply disruptions. And the combination of increased consumer demand and those huge uh, 
uh, supply problems. They're combining to push higher the costs of necessities like food and gas and housing. Normally when we think about inflation, we think about it as a supply or demand issue. Here in 2021, it's both. And these are uncharted waters for our country. And most traditional ec economists really don't know what to make of it because they haven't seen anything like this before. Now this issue really leapt to the front of the national consciousness in the month of October, because in the month of October, we saw just in one month, a six, well, what we saw in the month of October, excuse me, was a 6%, more than a 6% increase in prices from, this October, from last October, October of 2020, to October of this year. And that is not record-setting inflation in this country, but again, it's been quite a while since we've seen it. And what that does is not only does it strain the budgets of working Americans, because it makes goods, it makes produce, it makes food, it makes gasoline more expensive, it also complements investment decisions for businesses. You know, do they invest in new, uh, in, in new product, in bringing on new staff? It's a much more uncertain time. And of course, it's created major political challenges for the White House. Now, this inflation does not have any single cause, but nor does it have any obvious solution. Now, as all of you know, there have been trillions of dollars in federal aid between the stimulus package and the infrastructure bill that Joe Biden just signed yesterday, trillions of dollars of federal aid approved by Congress in response to the pandemic have led American consumers and companies to purchase more goods than ever before. We had a lot of built up savings that we put away during the shutdown. And now that the world is somewhat opening up, we're ready to spend again. Uh, it's also put new strains on global supply chains, and we talked about this a couple of weeks ago. Again, the heightened consumer demand for goods is straining the international shipping lanes in a way that we haven't seen in many, many years. Um, and that higher demand at the same time has also overlapped with a shortage of workers and a shortage of supplies and a problem with transportation capacity. And all of these problems are caused by the, we'll call them post-pandemic growing pains that we came back so quickly that the economic infrastructure, if you will, just simply wasn't prepared for this. So lots of things going on here. And once again, I think we'll stop and ask you a question. What do you think is the primary cause of this inflation? Is it the post-COVID spending, uh, consumer spending surge that I just mentioned? Is it? We haven't gotten to this yet, particularly when it comes to gasoline prices. As you may know, President Biden requested that OPEC's uh, oil producing countries increase gasoline supply to reduce the prices, and they refused to do so. So is OPEC keeping a tight rein on oil products, keeping gas prices high? Could the United States be reducing, price, uh, reducing gasoline prices by increasing our own, our own oil supply? Um, is the primary cause the supply chain problems that we talked about earlier? Or is it too much government spending, as we talked about earlier, between the infrastructure and the stimulus package, that's a lot of money being pumped into the economy that's now being spent. And when you have a lot of money chasing a relative shortage of goods, that will lead to price increases. The correct answer to this question, of course, is F, all of the above. But we didn't offer that option. So even if you'd agree that all five of these are contributing, to the inflation. Look, looking at our answers here, it's really interesting. 45% of you, almost half, talk about the supply chain problems, the, the difficulties in getting goods here from other parts of the world. And we will talk more about that later when we talk about potential solutions. 31%, the second highest number, almost a third, talk about the demand side, how consumers are spending more. And then smaller numbers for the other three, but what we see here among our group is a real split between those who emphasize the supply problems and those who emphasize the demand problems. Now, early on, it looked like the inflation was going to be limited to a relatively small number of sectors that were hit particularly hard by the pandemic. Uh, automobile purchases, restaurants, maybe a few others. But over the last few months, higher prices have spread throughout, throughout almost every sector of the economy. 
Gasoline prices are at a seven-year high, nationally over $4, and there are actually gas stations in California now charging over $6 a gallon. And the gas prices are that high because we're seeing an unusually high demand in Europe, given both the COVID recovery and unusually cold weather there. At the same time, that China is having a coal shortage as it tries to restart its economy. That's gasoline prices, but also food prices are rising at the highest level in over a decade since the Great Recession of 2008, 2009. Um, and that's as a result, just like there's unusually cold weather in Europe, increasing the, chain, uh, the cost of energy. Well, food prices are up because we're seeing other climate related catastrophes, severe droughts in China and throughout the Pacific Rim and in other parts of the world that are increasing demand for foreign sourced, uh, uh, for foreign sourced food. Um, this is increasing uh, prices for families and of course for restaurants, which means when you eat out, you're paying more than you would have a year or two as well. Now economists, Economists don't believe that these upward trends are going to go on indefinitely. Uh, the excess demand we're talking about created by pandemic relief is going to dissipate eventually because even though it's a lot of money, as time passes, it's going to be spent. Uh, the global supply chains will settle down as vaccines get distributed and the pandemic fades. But we don't know how long it's going to take for the inflation to subside. And the longer inflation lasts, the greater the political problem for the White House and for congressional Democrats. Now, Biden's already dealing with this on a number of fronts. The October inflation increase is causing problems for his Build Back Better legislative package, the social spending and climate change bill. that's now roughly $2 trillion worth of spending should it pass in its current form. We've already heard Joe Manchin, the moderate Democratic Senator from West Virginia, raising concerns about more government spending, worsening inflation. And my guess is, is that if Manchin is talking about this, we're going to hear it from another half a dozen or so Democratic senators in the very near future. In the meantime, of course, Republicans have gone on the attack. And at least according to polls, it's been one of their most effective attacks against the Biden presidency. Um, in the middle of all this, it's worth remembering that the US economy is growing at a fairly fast clip. Now, granted, we're coming from a very low starting point, given what the coronavirus did to us. But the US economy is growing in a way that many would not have predicted a year ago. And we're growing quickly when, we're compare, when you compare us to uh, other countries around the world. And it's entirely possible that the US could recover the lost economic output from the pandemic by the end of next year, 2022. Um, workers at the lower end of the, uh, uh, the income scale are seeing very substantial wage increases, even when you do factor in inflation. And job openings are pretty plentiful. The stock market's going up. And although inflation's up globally, otherwise the economy is actually looking fairly strong. So the challenge for Biden is in the long term, it looks like these things are going to work out uh, to his and the country's benefit. But Joe Biden doesn't necessarily have the luxury of the long term. He and his party have midterm elections coming up in less than a year. And many of the economic indicators that we've talked about are not really going to be fully felt by voters until sometime well after November of 2022. Um, so just in the last few weeks, we've heard Biden and congressional Democrats starting to take great pains to acknowledge the harm that rising prices are creating for American families. Earlier in the year, the Biden administration called it a transitory, a temporary problem, and we're telling people not to get too worried about it. That's changed now. And Biden, in his bill signing yesterday for the infrastructure package, talked emphatically about the potential impact on inflation and the, heart, the pain that many Americans are feeling because of inflation. And it's been reported that Democratic senators running for re-election 
have been getting briefed on how to talk about this and what they're getting told by the Democratic National Committee, very specifically when it comes to the Build Back Better legislative package, what they're told is don't talk about the bill in terms of a price tag. Don't talk about a $3.5 trillion bill or a $1.8 trillion or a $2.1 trillion bill. Don't talk about how much it costs. Talk instead about how much money this is gonna save Americans. So the politics on this are really tricky. And the polls right now have not been kind to Joe Biden. Number one, his favorable numbers are down. But second, even more telling, is a much larger number of voters have said in recent weeks that they don't believe that Biden is attentive to the issues that are most important to them. And inflation is top on that list. So some of that's perception, some of it's language, some of it's positioning. But what do you think? How is Biden handling this, this political challenge? In talking about inflation, we're talking about communicating to the American public as opposed to substantive remedies. Um, one, is he not being forceful enough? Does he need to be more aggressive in talking about this? Number two, on the flip, on the flip side, is he scaring people? Because of course the psychology of talking about inflation can inhibit purchasing and cause economic downturns going forward. Third, well, since the President of the United States can't single-handedly fix inflation, there's not really much he can say. And then fourth and finally, Biden needs to spend more time showing that he understands voter concerns. So let's see what we've got for our, our group's responses, Claire. Well, boy, that's a, that's a very emphatic response. 64%, almost three quarters of you, believe he needs to show more time uh, demonstrating his understanding of voter concerns. And add that to the 25% who said he hasn't been forceful enough, 89% are essentially telling you, step it up, Mr. President. So substantively though, before we move on to our next topic, let's spend just a minute or two talking about what Biden can be doing. Again, reigning in inflation, as Gerald Ford and Jimmy Carter and many other previous presidents will tell you, is a difficult thing to do. So from a policy standpoint, what can Biden be doing? Well, right now he's talking about the, the newly signed infrastructure package as a way of improving the nation's supply chain and therefore um, increasing the supply of goods. But that infrastructure package and the funding for roads and bridges and ports, that's gonna take years to implement. So that's a long-term answer. Probably most important, is the president's decision on who he will appoint as chair of the Federal Reserve. Will he reappoint Jerome Allen, the current uh, chair, or select Lael Brainerd, uh, one of the governors who's considered to be a much more progressive economic thinker than Allen. Allen's considered to be somewhat more centrist. Uh, Biden has indicated he'll make this decision within the next several days. And this will almost certainly be a topic for us going forward because of the critical long-term impact of how the federal reserve handles interest rates and therefore impacts inflation and job growth. But politically speaking, of course, Biden doesn't, as I said earlier, he doesn't have the luxury of waiting for the long term. So immediately a president doesn't have a lot of options. What can Biden do? Well, um, in addition to infrastructure, he can take more immediate steps to clear up the supply chains. But that creates a challenge for him with organized labor. Um, he can make it clear to the American public that buying more in, less expensive foreign goods should take priority over buying American. But that goes, uh, uh, but, but that creates a political cross current with the message he's been delivering over the last few years about the importance of buying American. Buying foreign is cheaper, but for all the other reasons that buying American makes sense, for the people of this country. You really do have uh, two goals working at opposite ends. Uh, Biden can, could reverse course on tariffs and instead of raising tariffs, lower them in order to make it less expensive both to export and to import goods. But of course that too contradicts existing administration policy. Finally, at least as it relates to the course of the price of gasoline, he could increase fossil fuel supplies, either temporarily by 
uh, deploying the strategic petroleum reserve where the country keeps immense amounts of gasoline for emergency purposes or by relaxing uh, regulations on the exploration and production of fossil fuels. But of course that runs against his climate change agenda. So all of these are policy tools that could reduce inflation, at least to some degree. But each one of them contradicts existing administration policy. And that's not me criticizing existing administration policy. The climate, you know, the climate change, the union rules, those are done for legitimate yeah, issue-based and policy-based reasons. But they do contribute at least to the obstacles that Biden faces when he talks about how to bring down inflation. So what's Biden's real decision? It's ideology or practicality. We'll see which way he goes in the weeks in the weeks ahead. Let's move on. We spent a little bit more time on that topic than I intended, and I apologize for that, but it's such an important one, both for the American economy, for the American family, and also for American politics. So let's spend some time now talking about critical race theory. And let's agree that in a better and less polarized world, we'd be able to discuss the best way to educate our children without the debate turning into insults and demagoguery and race baiting. But as we saw in the recent Virginia governor's race, and as we will almost certainly see in next year's midterm elections, American politics doesn't have a lot of room for nuance and subtlety. And so what ought to be, what could under better circumstances be, a fairly nuanced and important decision about how to discuss the history of race relations and civil rights in this country really has become extraordinarily polarized. Now, critical race theory was only one of many education-related issues that were discussed in the Virginia governor's race, and we talked about this last week. Uh, polling and exit interviews showed that much of the parental frustration uh, into which the Republican candidate Glenn Youngkin was able to tap first originated during the school shutdown caused by the coronavirus. And those parents watched as stores and restaurants reopened along with private and charter schools. At the same time, their children were enrolled in public schools that were still relying on Zoom-based remote learning. Well, even now that students have returned to the classroom, a lot of parents are still resentful. There's been long-term learning loss, particularly among minority and underrepresented communities. There's widespread evidence of emotional and psycho psychological damage that's been caused for those young people who are out of school for such a long time. So you have a lot of angry parents. And while we will talk about critical race theory in a minute, I wanted to begin by suggesting that in fact, that parental frustration that young can use to get elected and the Republicans seem very eager to use as a key issue in next year in uh, in next year's elections. There's a lot underneath the education issue of which critical race theory is the most visible aspect, but not the only aspect. So before we dig into the CRT issue, let's 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 talk about some of these broader. Let's talk about one of these broader issues. I mentioned the parental frustrations on school closings. Well, what do you think? Now, we know not all of you have children in public schools, so we've left an I don't know uh, answer available here. But the question for you is, how did the public schools in your, in your area handle COVID, in your opinion? Did the schools reopen too quickly? Did they reopen too slowly? Did they reopen at just the right pace? Or fourth, like I said, if you don't happen to have children in the public schools or for other reasons weren't exposed to these questions, it's totally appropriate to say I don't know. So what, uh, what does our group have to say, Claire? 51%, this is we have a pretty satisfied, satisfied group, slightly over half said that the schools reopened at the right pace, but it is interesting that even though it's smaller numbers, by an almost four to one margin, our group said that the schools reopened too slowly versus a, a smaller number, so they don't reopen too quickly. That's something that Young can use to his advantage in Virginia, and like I said, Republicans are very determined for uh, uh, to use to their benefit next year. All right, so let's dig into this question of critical race theory. Uh, critical race theory is an academic movement forwarded by civil rights scholars and activists to describe 
what they see as systemic racism in American society. Now, I mentioned this last week also in answer to one of your questions. Despite what many conservatives say, critical race theory is not taught in elementary and secondary schools. Despite what many liberals say, critical race theory does, however, influence the way that many public schools discuss race-based theories with their students. So it is largely a graduate school type of discussion that isn't talked about in elementary school or high school. But that higher education-based discussion about how to talk about race relations obviously has great impact on the way we teach these critical issues to our children. Um, let's go a little bit further on just the basis of critical race theory. Um, like I said, it's an academic concept. And it's about 40 years old now. And the core idea, to get a bit more specific, the core idea of critical race theory is that race is a social construct. And, that, and this is key. And that racism is not just the product of an individual's bias or prejudice, but rather racism is something embedded in the legal systems and structures and policies of our society. So the core idea of critical race theory, as I said earlier, is that race is a social context, is a social construct, but the argument suggests that it's not a matter of one of us saying or doing something wrong. It's something hardwired into our communities, into our society. And we're going to talk more about that in just a, we're going to talk about that more than just a minute or so. But even to go a step further on this, I would present to you that fundamentally, the disagreement springs from different conceptions of racism. Critical race theory puts an emphasis on outcomes, not on intentions. Critical race theory puts an emphasis on the end result as opposed to someone's own beliefs. And it calls on those outcomes and those end results to be examined and rectified. Whereas on the other side, those who, who, who do not subscribe to the critical race theory uh, dis, uh, idea would say, no, racism is an individual attitude and belief, not something as systemic and widespread as, widespread as the theory suggests. Now, where does this leave us? Well, like I said, in higher education, there's a very thoughtful and interesting and important discussion to take place on matters like this. But on a political landscape, one group argues that America is an irredeemably racist nation whose history is defined by white oppression against subjugated minorities. The other side argues that all traces of racism have long since been eradicated and that school books should overlook these past problems and focus on only the more uplifting aspects of the country's past. In other words, one side says that America is pristine and perfect. The other says that we're evil and immoral. And me, as a, as a centrist, I'd suggest that somewhere in between those two extremes lies a, another perspective, one that would allow students to learn that the United States has accomplished extraordinarily positive achievements over 240 years. But we've made horrible mistakes as well. We can teach both of those things. We can be proud of our successes and we can learn from our failures. We can teach young people, we can teach our students about both aspects of their very illustrious but obviously flawed heritage. There's a middle ground. The problem is that that conversation would require nuance and negotiation. It would require compromise and cooperation. And that's just not the way that American politics works today. So I'm going to ask you guys about critical race theory. I've done my best to present both sides in as even handed away as possible. You've heard me suggest that both sides are probably more extreme than I would prefer. But what do you think? Can we go up with our, our how would you describe this country's history of race relations? You'd say we've made mistakes, certainly, but we're not a racist country when it comes right down to it. 
would you say number two? Racism is an endemic and systemic problem, and we must confront it dramatically. Or third, racism, well, is a bad problem for much of our history, but we're on the right track now, so we really don't need to worry about that anymore. And it's worth, and, and my assumption is, is that what they, way you answer this question would also have a great impact on how you would want to see the history of civil rights and race relations taught in this country. Claire, can we see our results for this question? Wow, very interesting results. Wow, look at that. 66%, two thirds of our group says that racism is an endemic and systemic problem and that we need to confront it more dramatically than we do now. So most of our group, at least I would interpret, says that the teaching of critical race theory in a more dramatic and broad-based way is an important and essential thing to do. Um, I, as you heard earlier, I come down yeah, in the middle. I think that first uh, option is one that I would choose, that we have made very bad mistakes in the past and our legacy of racism is a shameful one. But on balance, I can't bring myself to believe that we are endemically and systemically a racist country. But the really nice thing about these kind of programs is we can discuss these issues you can discuss these issues calmly and rationally. And as I said earlier, that's just not the way American politics works today. Um, so in any case, get ready for both parties to forward the most extreme ends of this debate in dozens of swing states in next year's elections. Because it's a lot easier to trade insults and racially charged invective than to set aside partisan weapons to construct a public school system that can effectively serve its students. Deciding how to talk to young people about race, about civil rights, both current day and in our history, is an incredibly difficult and sensitive and complicated topic. Unfortunately for us, next year at least, we'll see it debated primarily in 30 second television and, and YouTube ads. But because we're politics in the time of coronavirus, and because we're the LA World Affairs Council Town Hall, we don't have to resort to that kind of blame laying and insulting and finger pointing. We can have a much more positive and valuable conversation. But we can't do that without Jessica DeGanzik. So if Jessica's willing to rejoin me, we can, there you are. Yeah. We can, uh, we can talk with our group about what they think about these two critically important issues. Great, thank you so much, Dan, and thank you to our audience. Let's jump in here. Do you think Manchin will be influenced by the fact that Larry Summers does not feel the Build Back Better bill is inflationary? Boy, so Lawrence Summers, who is uh, a Secretary of, of Treasury in Bill Clinton's administration and a key economic advisor to Barack Obama has been very critical for many months now of what he believes is a overly cavalier approach from the Biden administration toward the prospect of inflation. And while I don't think that Secretary Summers takes any comfort or joy in it, he clearly has been proven right because last spring when he was saying, be careful about funneling too much money back into the economy at the risk of causing inflation, he was largely dismissed by Biden administration representatives and the president's advisors. And now he has been proven right. But what's interesting about it is he has made it clear that even though he warned that the stimulus package was going to cause inflation, he Summers is still urging the passage of the president's current social spending and climate change bill, the Build Back Better initiative. Do I, th I don't think, for whatever it's worth, I don't think that will have a seminal effect on the debate. But I think it is something that smart people should pay attention to, because this is someone, Summers, who's one of the nation's most respected economic minds, maybe a bit too centrist or too establishment for some progressive Democrats, unacceptable to, for other reasons to conservative Republicans, but generally extraordinarily respected on his understanding of economic issues. And he did warn about this inflation, and he was right. And even though his, uh, his message now about passing Build Back Better is not going to get a great deal of attention. 
it is worth paying attention to for those of us who watch this, these discussions, uh, who watch these things closely. Yeah, we hosted him a while back and I'll need to go back and watch the video and, and see what he was discussing at that point because I'm sure he gave us some little insights there. Um, this questioner asks, is the infrastructure bill, sorry, will the infrastructure bill add to the deficit or is it fully paid by new taxes? Likewise with the Build Back Better proposal. Um, it depends who you ask. Um, on the infrastructure bill, the Biden administration tells you that it's fully paid for. The Republicans say that it's not. And the truth is neither side really knows for sure because both sides are making estimates of how much these items will cost and how much revenue will come in to pay for them. The stakes get even higher on the social spending and climate change legislation, the Build Back Better bill. And in fact, right now, Congress is waiting for the Congressional Budget Office, the nonpartisan arbiter, to offer its estimates on whether they think Build Back Better will add to the deficit or not. The Biden administration and many leading Democrats have said that it will not, but it does seem from the way they're talking about it that a lot of Democrats are nervous that the Congressional Budget Office is going to say, hey, wait a minute, this might not bring in as much in taxes as the Biden administration is saying. And if that's the case, it's not going to balance out, but it's actually going to add to the deficit. One of Biden's strongest talking points on both bills has been his ability to say, this doesn't add to the deficit, we're paying for these things. But the Congressional Budget Office, if they come to a different conclusion on that, could have a very, very harmful effect on Biden's ability to pass Build Back Better because there's just a bit more than a sufficient number of centrist Democrats in both the House and the Senate who, if they see this legislation adding significantly to the budget deficit, will have one more reason to vote no. And we mentioned earlier that the rise in inflation is causing a lot of Democrats. I quoted Manchin, but there's plenty of others who are thinking, wow, if inflation is already going up, does pumping this much more money into the economy make sense? Summer says go ahead and do it because the spending will be spread out over many, many years. But if you are a more centrist Democrat who pays closer attention to deficits than perhaps other members of Congress in either party do, then hearing from the Congressional Budget Office that this legislation doesn't pay for itself could make it a much, much uh, tougher, a much, much tougher vote. An increased demand for toilet paper does not seem to be a supply chain problem. So why do increased prices exist other than an ability for the providers to charge higher prices? Okay. So, you know, given the inflation, uh, the impact of inflation on food, um, on energy, on housing costs, I'm not minimizing the cost of toilet paper, but I would I also suggest putting it in, in context because while that particular shortage is to some degree exaggerated, it's not reflective of the broader inflationary challenges. That said, one of the reasons we're seeing these shortages for those types of consumer goods, just as we did at the very beginning of the pandemic, is consumer panic. If you believe that there's going to be a shortage of a particular type of product, whether it's toilet paper or potato chips or whatever else it might happen to be, then your natural instinct when you go to the store is to buy quite a bit of that product. And so many of us remember in March and April of 2020, taking our first trips to the grocery store to stock up and seeing that paper towels and toilet paper and bottled water were all gone. It's not because there was actually a shortage of those products or a supply chain problem, but because there was panic on the part of consumers, people like us who said, I don't want this stuff to run out without me having any, so I'm gonna buy more than I normally would. And while we haven't found that to be the case with many consumer products in this almost post-COVID era, it is still an issue with some consumer, uh, personal consumer goods. And toilet paper is one example of that. This is the latest appointment of a Fed chair by a president on record. Why the delay? So Biden has a difficult political decision here. Um, whether it's a difficult policy decision or not is another conversation. But as has been the case on so many other matters that Biden has taken on during his first almost year in office, 
he's facing a real divide between the moderates in his party and the progressives. Most of the moderate centrist Democrats um, are a very strong supporter of the current uh, uh, of, of, of the current board chair, uh, but an, any number of progressive voices led by Senator Elizabeth Warren are fierce critics of him and are supporting Governor Brainerd instead. When it comes down to substance, I don't know that there's a great deal of difference when it relates as it relates to interest rates between these two individuals, but the signal the appointment sends to two key factions in Biden's own Democratic Party is obviously of critical importance when he's trying to hold those factions together to pass an infrastructure bill and to pass this, this Build Back Better legislation. So my guess, and it is, it is only a guess, is that one of the reasons that Biden is delayed is he wanted to avoid offending either faction until he was able to pass the infrastructure bill and until he felt he was sufficiently close to passing the social spending and climate change legislation that he could afford to take this risk. Biden said just in the last day or so that he believed he would make the pick by the end of the week. We'll see if that happens. But if Biden does announce uh, a new or renewed Fed chair over the next several days, one thing it will tell us is that he is increasingly confident about Build Back Better passing. So I think it's, it's, it's more of a political challenge than a policy one. And the politics of it really more than anything is what's caused the delay. Thank you. Is inflation only happening in the United States or are there international examples? So it's a great question. And early on, when Lawrence Summers was warning about the prospect of inflation, one of the counter arguments that he was facing is that while inflation was uh, having some effect here in the United States earlier in 2021, it did seem to be a problem isolated to this country. And that's no longer the case. Uh, in Japan, in Western Europe, and any number of other countries around the world, they're seeing record levels of inflation too. And the reason that's such a problem is I believe the questioner uh, is, uh, is suggesting is that if our country is the only one facing inflation, then that's, then that's a challenge for all sorts of reasons. But at least as it relates to international trade and goods movement, we're not facing a crunch on the other end of the supply chain. But if our trading partners are also facing very difficult inflation, then they're constrained as well. And so, that, and, and so be, when this becomes a multinational problem, rather than one solely limited to the United States, it becomes an even harder one, an even harder problem for American politicians to solve. My own opinion, and I'm a long ago and still ardent free trader, is that as I said earlier, lower tariffs rather than higher by definition lowers the cost of goods. But as I've talked about on this webinar many times over the last year plus, the United States has entered much more of an isolationist time period, not just our political leaders, but the population. And so the political winds are blowing right now in favor of higher tariffs and higher trade walls. And although smart people can point to some benefits of those tariffs, almost by definition, they do result in, result in higher goods costs. The phrase post-COVID was included in one possible answer to one of today's questions. Are we really post-COVID or should we be approaching our economic future while keeping in mind the possibility of a COVID surge or new variant emergence as a factor that may continue to impact us economically? So very fair point. Uh, uh, letting all of you behind the curtain just a little bit, just as we're limited to five options on our questions, we're limited to a certain number of characters for each question and each answer. And so the reference to post-COVID was an abbreviated uh, effort to say, and I should have said it out loud, as we move into a closer phase, or our next phase, perhaps closer to post-COVID, um, as opposed to just simply declaring it post. COVID is not over. And in fact, Janet Yellen, Joe Biden's Secretary of the Treasury, said just this week that she believes that the best, if not only way, to fight inflation is to get past the pandemic. Governor Newsom and many of his colleagues around the country are warning about yet another surge this winter as the weather gets worse and people retreat indoors. So no, we're definitely not in a post-COVID era. And I apologize that our technological limitations 
um, overly simplified, uh, a much more intricate topic. So good for you for calling us out on it. Yes, send your angry letters to go to webinar. <laughs> We're trying. All right. Um, wouldn't a greater focus on a civics education in general be beneficial and less partisan than incorporating elements of critical race theory and social emotional learning into primary and secondary education? I think so. Uh, but as I've talked about occasionally on this program before, I am an absolutely immense advocate of dramatically increased civics education in our public schools. Most California public schools require one single semester of civics education before graduation. And in fact, that semester is really usually 15 weeks of civics and government and geography all crammed into one semester in either the 11th or 12th grade. And so of course what that means is the lesson that we're teaching our next generation of leaders is that this politics stuff, this government stuff, this democracy stuff is so unimportant. We're not gonna bother to talk to you about it for the first 10 years of school. And then we want you to miraculously 18 months later turn around and be a regular voter and a responsible citizen. My own feeling, uh, setting aside the critical race theory aspect of the question for a moment, is that as many of you know, Governor Newsom recently signed legislation on ethnic studies, mandating that of course in ethnic studies be taught in California public schools. After years of heated but ultimately productive negotiations, between minority caucuses, the Jewish legislative caucus, and other stakeholders in the education debate. In my own opinion, we would take this ethnic studies requirement, combine it with a civics education requirement, and in that reconstituted class, teach young people from underrepresented communities not only about their own heritage in the past, but also talk in the present and the future about how they can be civically and politically involved in their communities going forward. So I give the question a great deal of credit because I do think the shared responsibility, understanding that comes with good civics education is an ideal way for us out of what seems to be a pretty intractable mess. Uh, this questioner says, Dan, what would you suggest someone read to begin to understand critical race theory? Boy, um, I would, uh, th there, have been there have been books written on the subject, and what I'll do, just because I don't have a list in front of me, is I'll commit to sending Jessica and Clara a list to be disseminated to the uh, participants in our, in our webinar. But in the meantime, what I'd also say is, in addition to the mainstream newspapers, in addition to what the LA Times and the New York Times and, you know, and, you know, write about it, um, I'd encourage you to read education made publications. Education Weekly, the national uh, the national platform, um, EdSource uh, here in the state of California. And because while I am interested in reading what daily newspapers and mainstream news media have to say about the issue, they do tend to talk about it primarily in a political context. Whereas those publications and those media platforms that cover an issue in the context of instruction and pedagogy, are in all likelihood going to give us a better breakdown as to the substance of the theory as opposed to the impact of the argument over it. Thank you. Uh, Nancy, follow up with me and, and I'll make sure I'll get you that list and we'll get that published. Um, this questioner says, is critical race theory the main concern of parents or are they more concerned about political activism in the classroom as well as very mature adult topics being taught without being vetted or approved by parents? Well, also a really smart question and it does point out that critical race theory is only one small aspect of a much broader education debate that is begun to develop and will continue to grow in this country over the next year and beyond. Another flashpoint, and we talked about this briefly in last week's webinar, another flashpoint in Vienna, excuse me, in Virginia uh, in this year's election um, was the status of accelerated and advanced learning classes. The argument is made from some quarters in Virginia and other states that AP classes and other types of accelerated and advanced learning exacerbate racial, racial inequities. And so Virginia had been moving to not eliminate, but to diminish the number of advanced and accelerated classes available to students. And parents you know, fought back fiercely against this and Youngkin was able to leverage this issue uh, as part of the broader education discussion. 
Uh, there were also questions about what's appropriate to read in the schools. Now, Youngkin's campaign, as I think we discussed last week, um, used the example of the Pulitzer Prize winning book, Beloved by Toni Morrison, as an example of something that contained inappropriate uh, language and, and in conduct. And I'm not sure that using a Pulitzer Prize winning book by an acclaimed African-American author is the best way to make the point. But if you put aside that specific example, or I would say this, if, if you put aside the, the more highly charged aspect of the discussion, there are some extremely disturbing portions of Beloved. It's an extraordinary book, but it can be very, parts of it can be very painful to read. And some parents felt that their child at age 14, 15, 16 should not be reading something that disturbing. You may agree with them, you may disagree with them, but the debate over whether the parents should have some say into what type of uh, reading their children are exposed to and what they're protected from until the age that the parents think is appropriate is a legitimate discussion to have. And once again, it's going to get oversimplified in the midterm elections because that's what happens in campaigns. But far beyond the 30 second ads are really difficult questions about parental involvement and finding another way to resolve those conflicts other than on the campaign trail, I would argue is, probably, is, is almost certainly in all of our interests. This questioner says, hi, Dan. What are your thoughts on recommendations for LA City Council to address the houselessness crisis? It seems like we voted to pass legislation to help, but it seems to be a deepening crisis impacting both housed and unhoused LA residents. Okay. So it's been fascinating uh, to watch this discussion taking place both here locally and statewide in California. And my own feeling, and Jessica, we probably ought to set aside a full topic for this and talk about it for 15 minutes or so at some point in the future, because it's been a while since we've had a, uh, a designated topic on homelessness. But what I suggested the last time we examined that topic is, in my opinion, once you say there's a homeless crisis, or as this individual says, a houseless crisis, I think already you're off base. Because to me, there are three very different types of challenges that we're facing as a community and a society. And do we try to address them all with one broad brush, brush almost guarantees that at least two of the three are not going to be addressed satisfactorily. So on one hand, you have people who've suffered some short-term economic loss. Housing prices in California are sky high. They haven't been able to maintain payments. They're generally people who have been over the years contributing members of society who've hit some hard, hard times in an unforgiving housing market and they've had to leave their homes or their apartments, and that's tragic, and they deserve one type of help. Then there are those um, who've been, uh, who've been yeah, out on the streets for much longer periods of time. And if they ever were working or contributing members of society, it's been some years since they were. And those who are more long-term homeless really require an entirely different set of support mechanisms than someone who's just you know, lost their home on a short, uh, recently and hopefully temporary basis. And then of course you have the most difficult challenges of those with mental illnesses and very serious alcohol and drug problems. And I think if each, each three different cohorts and the only thing they have in common is that they don't have a proper place to live, but their needs are profoundly different. The short term or recently homeless, the long-term homeless and the psychologically or mentally uh, impaired or alcohol or drug dependent, three very different groups with three very different group of, uh, types of needs. And I'm immediately wary of any politician who says, here's my solution to solving the homelessness problem, because at best, they're only addressing one of the three. And my guess is if they are oversimplifying to that respect, they're probably not addressing even that one cohort to the degree that's necessary. So every big problem, every big problem is a lot of little problems put together. And so none of these, none of these three are little problems. They're all fairly large and immense and difficult in themselves. But I think the first step toward addressing any of them effectively 
is recognizing them as three very different sets of policy challenges that deserve three very different types of policy answers. Thank you. Uh, this question says, wouldn't it be prudent for the president to talk about Republican gerrymandering and encouraging his base to make sure that they vote to keep the Democrats in the majority? Okay. Well, I spent many years working as a political reformer. And one of the lessons I learned way too late in my years of trying to reform the political process, whether gerrymandering, whether campaign finance reform, other improvements to the process, is talking about the political apparatus to voters is very rarely a successful strategy when you talk in terms of the apparatus and logistics instead of the outcomes. Most people spend their lives thinking about good schools for their kids, good jobs, a comfortable retirement, clean air and water, uh, you know, affordable housing and reasonable transportation. They spend their time thinking about tangible outcomes. And I agree with the questioner, by getting rid of gerrymandering, either Republican or Democratic driven, is an important step toward competitive elections and therefore toward more productive policy solutions. But when I, as a reformer, get down in the weeds of why legislative and congressional districts are drawn a certain way, about why campaigns are financed in a certain fashion, I lose that voter pretty quickly. And so the challenge for Biden and for other political leaders who do believe in reforming the system is to talk about means and ends. Okay? If we change this aspect of the way politics is practiced, here's what it will mean to you and your life and your children and your future. That isn't an easy, uh, isn't an easy messaging goal. It's a frustration that Biden, I think, has faced in talking about voting reform more broadly. And on gerrymandering, it's an ex on gerrymandering and on redistricting and reapportionment, it's an extremely difficult one. So I think if he wants to talk about voting, I think that can be helpful. But I think Biden or any politician needs to be mindful about talking about it as a means to an outcome, as a means to an end that the average voter can understand and appreciate and feel and see in their daily lives. This questioner asks, why isn't the administration supporting Vice President Harris to be more successful instead of letting her swing in the wind? Well, there have been a number of uh, articles, which it sounds like this questioner has read, um, asking or speculating about potential tensions between the president's advisors and the vice president's advisors. And this is, first of all, these tensions have existed in every White House ever. Uh, there were rumors about whether Donald Trump would replace Mike Pence. There were rumors about whether Barack Obama would replace Joe Biden with Hillary Clinton, if you remember. And the idea that there was fighting between the president or vice president and their staffs, uh, or that the president's staff was maligning the vice president behind his and now her back, I guess is George Washington's advisors were trash talking John Adams behind his back. So this is nothing new. What exacerbates the situation is that Joe Biden is the oldest American president in our history. And that means that even though he's indicated he's likely to seek his second term, there can't help but to be speculation given the fact that he's 78 years old that he might not run again. And so that accelerates this conversation. Um, the second aspect of it is there's a member of Biden's cabinet, the Secretary of Transportation, Pete Buttigieg, who's looked on very, very favorably and fondly by many Democrats, including the President of the United States. Biden has led it to be known to, refer, to friends of his, it's been reported, that Pete Buttigieg reminds him, the President, of his late beloved son, Beau Biden. And many of the articles about Harris's precarious political standing have positioned her against Buttigieg, saying that, if Biden were to not run for president again, are there leading Democrats, and there are, who would support Buttigieg in a primary over the vice president? Um, as these stories have appeared, uh, Jen Psaki, the White House press secretary, has spoken out very emphatically on Harris's behalf. But there's a lot of anonymous quotes in these articles in which unnamed Biden advisors let it be known that they are somewhat underwhelmed with Harris's performance in office. And if Biden does want to shut that down, he can. 
uh, it'll be worth seeing whether he, whether he decides to or whether he decides to or not. Harris, and I'll just say, I know we're right up against six o'clock, Jessica. It is worth noting that Harris has been given two extraordinarily difficult assignments by the president to examine the root causes of immigration and to deal with the Voting Rights Act and voting reform in this country are not easy issues. Whereas Pete Buttigieg, and I don't say this to diminish him, not in the slightest, as Secretary of Transportation, now that this infrastructure bill has passed, Pete Buttigieg is gonna spend the next two years traveling the country, literally handing out billions of dollars into local communities so that they can build roads and bridges and increase broadband and so forth. And so if I'm a Kamala Harris advisor, I'm thinking, looks like he's getting the better end of the deal here. And so if Biden does want to uh, balance that off, it's something he's probably going to have to do himself. Very interesting. Well, Dan, thank you so much for another uh, fascinating talk. And for our audience, just so that you guys know, next week is Thanksgiving, and Dan is going to take a day off, a week off, which he richly deserves. <laughs> so, um, so join us that following week. And just a reminder that for our members, we host an after the webinar session with Dan every other week where you're able to ask him your questions directly. So if you'd like to learn about joining those events and becoming a member, please contact our office or visit our website. And if you'd like to support the council and programs like these and to learn about our upcoming events and membership, please visit our website at lawacth.org. Dan, thank you so much for joining us again. And thank you to those who joined us and catch us on the replay on YouTube. And uh, we look forward to seeing you for our next event. Have a great thank Thanksgiving. You, Thanks, everybody.